Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And we've got one for you today. David Hamilton is one of the best-known voices in British radio. He's a legend, a star that started in 1959 and has been heard ever since through BFBS, Melody, Capital Gold, Classic Gold, Prime Time, the BBC, and now he's talking to us. David, how are you? Hello, Alex. I'm very well, thank you. Do you know, it's really lovely to talk to you. You've got this new book out about the golden age of Radio 1. Is radio going through a golden age now, or were you at the height of it, do you think? <laughs> well, I would, I, I would say I was at the height of it, wouldn't I? I mean, everybody would say that their, their golden years are the best. But I think the, the premise behind the book is that when Radio 1 opened, in 1967, which is now 50 years ago, there was no other radio. So it was certainly a golden age for the DJs because audiences were enormous. And it was very simple at that time because pop music was enjoyed by entire families. The same people who would sit around the television watching Top of the Pops would also listen to Radio One. Mm -hmm. And pop music was enjoyed from members of the family, from the grandparents right through to the grandchildren. So. Uh, Radio 1 could really appeal to everybody across the board, whereas today it would probably be, be appealing really just to pretty young people. Mm. It's amazing as well. You guys were mega stars. When we look back, particularly probably the 70s was the best decade for radio and DJs. We'll get to the downside of that later. But to be part of that sort of birth of Radio 1 and the heyday of Radio 2, I mean, you've worked for some astonishing radio stations. Do you have a favourite at this point? The most exciting time for me really was 1973 when I was given my own daily radio show on Radio 1. Um, and along with Tony Blackburn in the morning, I, I was the first DJ to have a three-hour show. Nobody had had a three-hour show until then. So Tony was on from 9 till 12 and I was on from 2 till 5. Um, and it was just to be part of the scene that there was uh, at that time, the, the pop music scene. I always loved music. And um, uh, the first time I played it was when I was on the British Forces radio station in Germany in 1959. That was also a very exciting time. I was doing my national service in the RAF, and Elvis Presley was there at the same time doing his national service with the U.S. Army. And I, I played his records, and I thought, often thought to myself, well, what if Elvis is listening? Because mm -hmm. I, I did a rock and roll show. I was one of the first people to do a rock and roll show. And I persuaded the boss who ran the studios in Cologne, that uh, we should have rock and roll. I said, all this music uh, that you're playing, uh, Peggy Lee and Bing Crosby, is fine for the officers, but the troops want rock and roll. I don't think he actually knew what rock and roll was, but anyway, he gave me a show, and because he was perhaps a little bit embarrassed about transmitting this heathen music, <laughs> he followed it with a speech by the Padre. So the Padre came on to cleanse their sins. Wow. I mean, amazing time as well. I mean, two-way family favourites really was uh, an astonishing bit of radio that actually had great importance aside from the music and aside from you. What you were delivering actually was sort of bringing families back together. It was really important radio. Well, I described um, family favourites as the only radio show that had its own smell because when you heard the theme song on a Sunday lunchtime at 12 noon, you could smell the roast beef and Yorkshire pudding mm. that was cooking in millions of homes around the country. Everybody had sat down to a roast dinner <laughs> in those days. So it was, it was a show that had its own smell. Um, a, a play on family favourites was very important to the pop stars of the day. And if they couldn't get their record played in London, maybe because it was rock and roll, then they would come out to Germany to promote it. The first British pop star... I ever met was Cliff Richard, who came out to promote his record, Move It. And my first impression was of Cliff was, I thought, what a nice guy. We were about the same age. We were both teenagers. And uh, he was a joy to interview. And I've met him down the years. And he's always been the same. I've never changed my, my mind about that. First international star I met was Connie Francis, who came out to promote her record, Lipstick on Your Collar. Wow. And um, she met about a dozen of us at the studio, and she remembered everybody's name. And I, I thought, God, that's incredible. And for me, when she turned to me and said, what do you think, David? Um, here I was, a 19-year-old Spog doing his national service. He was an international star, like Connie Francis, calling me by my name. I nearly spilled my drink, which, by the way, was probably a lemonade. <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, you've done nearly 15,000 shows in total. I wonder as you sit here now, how many shows did you have to do before you found your own voice and you felt like David Hamilton could become DH on the air? Well, I think uh, through my life, I think I've had a few different voices. When I was uh, at school, I went to a, a grammar school in Surrey and... Um, you know, we were sort of, you know, hard boys. We liked our football, and uh, I probably had a bit of a South London accent. And when I uh, told some of my colleagues at the school I wanted to be a disc jockey, they laughed at me. They said, how are you going to be on the on the wireless, as we called it then, with um, a South London accent when all the disc jockeys talk posh? Mm. So I hired a Grundig tape recorder. It was a huge thing with spools, and I lugged it home, and I read things into it and gradually um, sort of taught myself to, to speak better, as it were. And uh, I've heard some early recordings from my career where I actually sound terribly posh. I'm talking about television. Yes. And, and <laughs> so then the third voice came probably about the time that I joined Radio 1 when suddenly posh was out. And um, the thing then really was to be not really transatlantic, but to have almost no accent at all. Funnily enough, now, accents are absolutely in. And, um, you know, you even hear continuity announcers on television, mm. which is another job that I did at one time. You hear them with broad accents. So e everything changes. I noticed last night I was watching BBC One and they've got somebody from the North East, YA man doing all that business uh, in between the programmes on BBC One. I mean, that would have been unheard of 20 years ago, 10 years ago, probably. Well, you're absolutely right. What's very funny is that I started my career um, in the very early days as an announcer at Time Tees Television at Newcastle. And when I went up there, they had four or five announcers, one woman and I think uh, probably four men. And they all spoke what, what is called standard English, uh, you know, so, so everybody accepted the fact that uh, we spoke in this kind of uh, accentless way. Um, maybe chat perhaps a little bit posh. I've seen a television interview that I did with Eric Burden from The Animals at that time. <laughs> really, you know, here's this Geordie boy, way, eh? And here's this sort of chap with a pocket handkerchief saying, and your name is? <laughs> really, really quite... Uh, hilarious but um, I think people up there accepted us and that's how it was whereas now as you say uh, people with Newcastle accents are I, I think you know particularly broadcasting on the on the world service uh, as I did at times in the 70s I think the the idea of somebody with no accent was that broadcasting to all these foreign countries and this you know applies to PFBS as well broadcasting to all these foreign countries around the world people could understand more what you were saying. If you had an accent, uh, a Geordie accent or a Birmingham accent or a, a Scottish accent, mm. people perhaps wouldn't understand you as well. So I think that was the thinking behind it at that time. How hedonistic were those days? As we look at the late 60s into the 70s, you were one of the biggest stars in the country, if not the world, meeting the biggest stars in the world. How fun was that? Because that's strange, isn't it? Not everybody gets to meet Connie Francis and, and the biggest stars in the world. No, it was great fun. I, I worked with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. I introduced the Beatles in, in concert in Manchester and uh, I introduced the Rolling Stones also in Manchester because I was living up there in Palace Theatre. Quite a funny story about that, actually. I had a, a little red MGB sports car that I was rather proud of at the time. It was a new model, and I parked it at the back of the theatre. Somebody thought it was Mick Jagger's car and scratched a love note um, on the bonnet. So for a week, I was driving around with I love you, Mick, on the bonnet of <laughs> the car which is quite funny. Um, then later on, I worked with David Cassidy in Bay City Rollers, compared their tours. David mm. Cassidy, uh, he was a lovely guy, but he, he hated the girls screaming while he was singing because, you know, he's basically a good singer. So he put cotton wool in his ears so he couldn't hear the girls screaming. And then, unfortunately, he couldn't hear the band. So that, that didn't work out so well. I think that... I think that star that I was most excited to meet and I did an interview, a TV interview with him very shortly before he died was Roy Orbison and if anybody would to ask me why I think it was because Roy Orbison had been there throughout my life I, I remember buying Only the Lonely which was his first hit record about 1960 went straight to number one and I remember buying it and 
playing it over and over again on my father's radiogram. And my father said to me, why are you playing the same record over and over again? And I said, because it's wonderful. Mm. And so then years later, to actually be sitting opposite Roy Orbison, even though he had his shades on, I thought, God, I, I never thought I would meet the big O. So, mm. yes, it was very exciting meeting these guys, playing football with Rod Stewart and charity football matches and uh, Elton John, you know, good times. Incredible times. And I don't think they'll ever be repeated, will they? I don't want to be one of these naysayers that, that sort of says that the, the present isn't as fun as the past. You had a good time, didn't you? Well, who knows? I mean, people, obviously, you know, people of a different generation are very excited to meet the, the, the stars of today. Mm. Um, I, 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 I've been doing a, a, a tour with a band and singers called David Hamilton's Rock and Roll Back the Years. It's a theatre tour. We started doing it last year and uh, we're still doing it now. And what, what's incredible about it is that all those songs, which are mainly 60s, but one or two are late late 50s, mm. um, still sound so great today. The words were great, the melodies were great. And uh, when they were written, you know, uh, pop music is essentially ephemeral. It's, it's of the moment and then it's gone. But these songs have stayed around all this time. But what is incredible, you get younger people in the audience who, who know the words and sing along and dance to them. So, yeah, um, I think quality, quality music. Mm. And then we look at you. You mentioned earlier the people you'd work with, like Tony Blackburn. There was a wonderful sort of fake war between you and him, which goes down in sort of radio history as being one of the best, where two mates made out they hated each other and were competing with each other. In fact, all along, you were good mates, weren't you? Well, um, I, I became very friendly with Tony in the early days at Radio 1. And when I finally got a daily show we pretty well decided that we're going to be rude about each other and <laughs> let people speculate whether we liked each other or not. And um, he did a, an edition, an entire edition of Top of the Pops, wearing a, a T-shirt saying, I, had, I hate David Hamilton, which he obviously had specially made. And then I made a little appearance and I came on with a T-shirt saying, and I hate Tony Blatner. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a kind of, um, it was a sort of love-hate thing. But... Um, uh, Tony, uh, I was his best man when he got married, and uh, he did once say that he didn't have any friends because they got in the way of work, which did sort of surprise me a bit. And I thought to myself, well, I thought I was, I thought I was his friend. Certainly, when his his first marriage broke up, I think I did quite a lot to cheer him up because he was very down at the time and, mm. and playing records for Tessa, his his first wife, on the radio. And um, I think I said to him, look, you've got a, you've got a lot to live for. You're, you are, you're young, you, you're good looking, you've got a few bob in your pocket. Mm. And there are lots of uh, great women out there. So, you know, come on, let's go out and meet them all. So I think I did what a friend should do and tried to cheer him up. Do you think he meant it then when he said he hadn't got any friends? Or do you think he was just saying it for saying its sake? Well, I think sometimes he just says something for effect. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like like he said that uh, you know he'd slept with 250 women, and uh, on the, on his uh, 60th birthday he asked me to make a speech. So I got up and I said uh, I did tell Tony that that was not a good career move, saying that he'd slept with 250 women. So he said why, and I said well only 250. A few days later, Kenny Lynch said 5,000. <laughs> So anyway, the next time Tony was quoted, it had gone up to 500. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> How distressing was it on a more serious note? You mentioned earlier Cliff, I'm thinking Gambaccini and of course Tony. When these accusations were made against them, they were front page news, accused of the most vile things and it was obviously untrue. That can't have been a nice time for you to see many of the friends and colleagues you'd worked with for decades uh, sort of taken across the papers and given a whipping for no reason. Obviously, the Savile business was terrible and uh, spoiled, really, uh, people's memories of what had been, for most people, a lovely and very carefree time. Mm -hmm. um, I think after that, uh, Dave Lee Travis was extremely unlucky to get a, a, a three-month suspended sentence. I mean, uh, um, what he had done was, it, it wasn't anything like, although it, it was likened to Savile, it wasn't anything like on the same scale. It certainly didn't involve underage women mm. or 
well. So, uh, and he was cleared of 14 of the 15 accusations, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was. I felt felt for Dave. I felt that that was very mm. tough on him, and almost like he was make a, made a sort of scapegoat. Me too. But, and he's lost uh, everything, hasn't he? His house, his career, his yeah. reputation. It's very sad. Yeah, yeah. And Dave, you know, Dave is a is a a, a decent guy. And I don't. I I think he was really, you know, quite harmless. And uh, so, yeah, I felt I felt very sorry for him that that should happen. But um, I, I think the uh, the unfortunate thing about uh, all of that was just that it it spoiled. You know, people had very happy memories of that time, sixties and seventies, mm. and in a way, it, it sort of spoiled that. And uh, you know, people. A lot of people asked me if I knew about Savile. And Savile didn't mix with the rest of us. He kept himself very much to himself. So um, uh, pretty well, as I say in my book, if I had gone to the controller of Radio 1 and said, I believe that Jimmy Savile is a paedophile, he probably would have said to me, how dare you come in here saying that? Mm. You know, what proof have you got? And I wouldn't have had any proof. So, I, you know, you can't act on rumors. And I couldn't have said anything about it anyway. But... Uh, you know, there were rumours about him that were flying around, but, I, I, you know, I, I think you can only uh, accuse somebody of something when, you, when you've actually been a witness or you've actually seen what they're doing. I can't think of any other story like it in my lifetime where somebody has had the reputation of a saint when they are mm. alive and then after they're dead, all these awful things come out and, and you realise they were something quite different. I mean, I've lived now for quite a long time. Mm. I've never known a story like that. I just find it quite extraordinary. And when people like Tony were wrongly accused, were you first on the phone to call and support? Because I know that's the time you find out who your friends are. Uh, well, uh, where, where, where Tony is concerned, um, I, I found that whole business a bit strange. I mean, uh, it was, it did seem a bit odd. And, um, you know, I was working for the BBC, so it wasn't any really any comment that I could make about it. Um, mm. I was just slightly perplexed about it, actually. And uh, I, you know, uh, I find that, again, find the whole thing uh, very odd indeed. I mean, the fact that they they sacked him and then took him back, I mean, it's inexplicable, really. But yeah. we, we live in funny times now, you know. It would be nice, really, to move on from the from the whole thing now. And, and yeah. with, with the anniversary coming up of Radio One uh, and Radio Two, and indeed the demise of the Light Program, uh, to look back on all the good things and all the good times mm. uh, and all the great broadcasts and the great broadcasters. And um, I really just wrote this book to celebrate the people that I worked with at the time and, and to try and put in perspective, really how much Radio 1 meant at that time. You, but you think there are over 600 radio stations mm. registered in the country now. And at that particular time, there was really only one. Yeah, incredible. Um, and yeah, it is incredible. And so audiences were vast. Yeah. And the DJs of the day were celebrities. I mean, I, I mentioned in the book that when Tesco opened their great, huge supermarkets around the country, they were opened either by stars of Coronation Street or Radio 1 DJs, and mm -hmm. enormous audiences turned up. I mean, I can remember doing um, opening a supermarket in Oldham with Ken Dodd, who you know, I'd been working with mm -hmm. in the 60s. I mean, obviously he was a huge star, but I remember the crowd stopped the, stopped the traffic. It was almost like a cup final crowd. They were, mm -hmm. they were, they were all down the road, all down the streets, all around the supermarket, the whole, the whole town ground to ground to a halt. I can't imagine that happening today. I think it was because there were fewer channels, and stars were bigger because of that. You know. Yeah. So let's talk about Doddy a minute. I mean, he's a mutual friend of both of ours. He is, in my view, Britain's greatest front of cloth comedian ever. He's one of the funniest men, I think, in the world ever. And he's still with us and turns 90 this year, but just became Sir Ken Dodd, of course. Um, what, what does he mean to you at this point? I mean, there's no one quite like him. There's certainly no one left quite like him. Well, it was a tremendous break for me because uh, that was also 1967, so it's also 50 years ago. Doddy's music box, and uh, I was chosen to, to be his straight man, uh, as it were, mm. uh, on two TV series, one in 67, one in 68. And uh, I learned so much uh, working alongside uh, you 
know, a top comedian of the day, uh, his lifestyle seemed extraordinary. Rehearsals were always interrupted with phone calls from his agent, his manager, uh, his publicist, even his tailor. <laughs> and um, he, a lot of people, when he was doing his appearances, said, oh, can, can you bring Diddy David along as well? So suddenly I was, uh, I was hauled along. And we had, we had great times. And, you know, it, the guy was just full of heart. I, I, I was doing a pantomime, my first pantomime, Bradford Alhambra, I was playing Buttons. And uh, he came along and uh, just turned up at the matinee in the afternoon. And then he said, come on, I'll take you out for dinner. I thought, wow, that's great. I mean, Ken was known as being a little bit careful. Mm -hmm. But what was funny was we went to the fish and ship shop across the bar, across <laughs> the street, and we went into the back, and it wasn't licensed. He pulled two lagers out of his overcoat pocket, <laughs> and uh, he said, cotton ships twice, love. Yeah. And I thought, well, here I am. I'm with the, the man who's the Variety Club Entertainer of the Year. He's been mm -hmm. number one in, in the charts with tears. Um, he's doing this, in, you know, enormously uh, top top twenty television show, and we're in a fish. We're sitting here having dinner in a fish and chip shop. But he gave me wonderful advice on how to play buttons, and I thought, what would I rather do? Would I rather um, be in the best hotel, and we're talking about holidays and football, or would I rather be in a fish and chip shop? And I'm, he's giving me wonderful advice on how to play buttons because he was a wonderful buttons himself. Yeah, incredible legend. And what a thrill for you to be christened Diddy David by him, which has lived on. I guess you embrace that and you still love it. Well, uh, it got me known at the time. And uh, it's, he, he did say to me the first time he called me, he said, do you mind? He took me to one side during rehearsal and said, do you mind me calling you that? He said, because uh, if you mind, I won't do it anymore. He said, but if you don't mind, I think it'll stick. And I said, I don't, I don't mind. I've been stuck with it now for 50 years. So. Beautiful. Well, what yeah. a great honour. And uh, to see him still on stage at 90 doing what he does as well as he ever did is still remarkable, isn't it? Well, incredible. I mean, his energy, his retention, the fact that he could do all that material without repeating himself. And he does long, long shows, as yes. you know. I mean, he <laughs> shows about five-hour shows. I mm. mean, he is, he is an incredible man. Yeah. And uh, I do feel very honoured uh, to have worked alongside him. Yeah, what a blessing. What a thrill. I really, truly believe you were there part of the heyday of show business, let alone radio or TV, and you've done it all. What a legend you are. As we look at the papers today, of course, the big story is the BBC and pay. It's somewhat unedifying, all of this, really, because if you look compared to America, everybody's poorly paid in this country in show business, and certainly most in radio are not getting anything to scream about. They're making a big fuss about Ken Bruce's salary compared to uh, Chris Evans, who's on 2.2 million. <laughs> Well, I haven't, I haven't all heard all that. No doubt I'll read it in the papers tomorrow. Mm. All I can tell you was that back in the days when I was at Radio 1 and Radio 2, we, we weren't paid a lot of money in those days. It's a bit like footballers, you know. They, it, it's something, this big money is something that's happened maybe with the turn of the millennium. Maybe mm. you could date it from there. But um, in my day, we didn't earn very much money. And we had to go out doing gigs three nights a week. And... Which, by which I mean clubs, you know, and, and and in a club you could earn in a night what you what it took you a week to earn on the radio. So we were, we were not highly paid. And I remember when I did Top of the Pops, never being paid a hundred pounds. My my fee for doing Top of the Pops was was ninety something pounds. And um, <laughs> sometimes uh, on a Wednesday night when it was recorded, I would go after it and I'd do a disco in a pub in the Old Kent Road. Well, I got paid about three times as much, and I thought, how can this be right? Like? I'm I'm earning this money for, for playing to 200 people in a, in a pub in the Old Kent Road. Of course, what I realised was that the top of the pops in the Radio One gave you the shop window to do the gigs, mm -hmm. but it was the gigs then where where we where we earned the money, and uh, I I was never paid uh, big money in radio. If, if DJs now are earning big money. That's something that's happened since. I mean, in, in the days when I was there, the BBC had to be very careful with their money because it was it was seen as um, uh, you know licensed payers' money, and so they was they were always seen to be very careful with that. I think what may have happened in recent times is that they've had to become more competitive, and so that all their best talent isn't stolen by. ITV or the commercial radio stations, I suppose they've had to pay them more, and that's probably how it's happened, you know. 
And we should say, I mean, Chris Evans has got the number one radio show in Britain, and I think it puts him at about nine grand a show at 2.2 million pounds. I know in local radio, I earn about 150 quid a show. So there is a difference, isn't there, David? Well, uh, yeah, I'm I'm working for BBC Local Radio now. And I, I can tell you that no one, no one's getting, no one's getting wealthy uh, on that. That's for sure. <laughs> but, um, I, I do it because I still love doing radio, mm. um, and you, you know what that's like. Uh, and uh, I, I do it not for the money, but I do it because, I, uh, you know, I, I love doing it, and it's a little bit of pocket money for me. But I certainly, uh, probably, will be staggered when I find out what people are earning today. But then a very good friend of mine is George Cohen, who is the um, Fulham footballer who played for England in the World Cup squad in 66. Mm. And George uh, never earned much money and is staggered by what today's footballers are earning. You know, he hears about footballers, fairly run-of-the-mill footballers earning 40000 a week. Mm. And he's gobsmacked, but, but there you are. David, thank you so much for your time. It's been an honour talking to you. You are a gentleman, you have class, and you are one of our greatest broadcasters in history. To only have your voice for a day would be a great uh, thrill. Thank you so much for your time. You can get the new book by going to Amazon, put in David Hamilton, Golden Days of Radio 1. It'll come up. And thank you again for your time, David. Alex, thank you very much. That was beautiful. Thank you so